Let's return to Kant's ethics and think about the other formulas. I've talked already about the formula of universal law and how it applies to perfect and imperfect obligations. But there are also a number of different formulations. One of them, the formula of the law of nature, is almost identical to the formula of universal law, so I'm going to leave that one out and proceed directly to the next formulation, the formula of humanity. That's something that I think plays a crucial role in Kant's ethical theory. In a certain sense, the formula of universal law comes first because theoretically it gets at the heart of what it is to have a good will. It's the best theoretical explanation of what's wrong with wrong actions. It involves someone making an exception for themselves, refusing to universalize their maxim, acting on the basis of something they could not will that everyone act upon. The formula of humanity, though, is much more intuitive. It's a complicated test and often a surprising test to apply the formula of universal law, but the formula of humanity is highly intuitive. It's something that fits into our common sense notions of ethics very well. And so I think Kant really intends this to be his practical test. He thinks they're equivalent. He's not going to say, look, this is a different principle. It's the same principle. And in fact, he argues that it follows very directly from the formula of universal law. But it has a different flavor to it, and it is in a way much, much easier to apply. So let's take a look at the general map again of the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. I think he thinks that this concept of a good will as the one and only thing that is good without qualification leads us to the idea that there can be one categorical imperative and that it's based on the idea of what a good will is. It avoids subjective particular determinations and decides on the basis of universal considerations. So what am I to do? Fundamental categorical imperative, the formula of universal law, I act only on those maxims I can at the same time will as a universal law. But now we go around to the other formulations of this one fundamental categorical imperative, and he's going to argue that that entails the formula of humanity, which in turn implies what is called the formula of autonomy. That implies the formula of the kingdom of ends, and that in turn implies the formula of universal law. Putting all that together, we get the conclusion that all of them are equivalent formulations of one fundamental principle whose intuitive content is roughly have a good will. Well, here is the formula of humanity. Treat humanity in every case, whether you're in your own person or that of anyone else, as an end, never only as a means. Treat humanity in every case, whether in your own person or that of anyone else, as an end, never only as a means. He explains, rational beings are called persons because their very nature points them out as ends in themselves. That is, as something that must not be used merely as means, and so far, therefore, restricts freedom of action and is an object of respect. So another way of putting this is, we may not use other people. We may not even use ourselves. People deserve respect. People have a right to respect. You should respect yourself and you should respect other people. We are ends in ourselves. We are not mere tools, mere instruments, mere means to be used by other people. Man, and generally any rational being, exists as an end in himself, not merely as a means to be arbitrarily used by this or that will. Well, here, I think, is how Kant's test then goes. He's saying, here's how practically we do things most of the time. We don't really have to think, what if my maxim were universal law and blah, 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 would it be self-contradictory in some way? Instead, he says, here is the basic content of this rule, which is very easy to use. A good will is one that acts out of respect for the moral law, and in particular, acts out of respect for other rational beings. So here's one way of putting the formula of humanity. You ought to respect moral agents. Another, don't use people. Another, treat people as ends, never only as means. That's almost exactly what he says. Don't use other people, don't exploit them, respect them as rational, moral agents in their own right. Now, you might notice here that this idea of using someone else is a sort of tricky notion. What is it to use someone else merely as a means? We use other people all the time. I mean, when you watch this video, 
you're using me right now as a way of learning about God's ethics. And so this is something that is not itself immoral. We use other people to help us attain our ends. In fact, there's nothing illegitimate about that. Remember, he says, actually, we have this obligation to help others, partly because we do need the help of other people, and we may use that help to attain what we want. So there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with going into the store and using the shopkeeper to get the object that you want. So using is not really the problem, but using in the morally objectionable sense, using merely as a means, using only as a means, well, that's different. That isn't just getting somebody else's help or assistance or um, you know, help using them as a bit of a means to get what you want, where you respect them as a moral agent in the transaction. No, it's where you don't show that respect for them as a moral agent. So we'll have to see carefully what that means, and it can be controversial exactly what that means. But Kant doesn't mean you should just never rely on anyone else or never have someone else help you attain your ends. Not at all. Now, here is the argument. The foundation of this principle is rational nature exists as an end in itself. Man necessarily conceives his own existence as being so. So far, then, this is a subjective principle of human actions. But every other rational being regards its existence similarly, just as on the same rational principle that holds for me. It's a little hard to unpack that argument, but I think it's actually a very nice argument, and here's how it goes. Rationality is a matter of using reason to choose means to obtain your ends, your goals. Well, as a rational being, are there any ends I necessarily value? We may value all sorts of different ends. I value many ends that you probably don't value, partly because I have particular tastes and preferences and so on, and it's fine to act in a way that is about that. I mean, we shouldn't attribute to the formula of universal law such a sweep as to say, I'm never allowed to get this food and eat it because it's something I like or I want. But instead, I have got to think, well, okay, yeah, there are all sorts of different things that different people want. I love pizza. Other people might not. I love mushrooms. Some other people might not. I love listening to music. Other people might not. And so on. So we all vary with respect to the ends that we value and the various activities that we value. But are there any ends that we all adopt, that we all value as rational beings? Kant says, yes. As a rational being, I value my own rationality. And as a rational being, you value your own rationality. Why? Well, you like getting what you want, don't you? You value your ability to get what you want. Rationality is a matter of getting what you want. So, Yes, of course you value your own rationality. Every rational being values his or her own rationality. But if that's right, if as a rational being I necessarily value my ability to use mean to, means to attain my ends, and so do you, well, that tells me something very important. Because the formula of universal law said that I can act only on maxims I can will as universal laws for every rational being. So if I am going to value my own rationality, I have to value your own rationality. I have to apply that across the board, okay? I value my ability to use means to attain my ends, so I've got to, attain, uh, I've got to value any rational being's ability to use means to attain their ends. So I've got to value their rationality. I've got to respect people as rational agents. And that respect for other people's rationality is something that really is a moral imperative. Now, can I use people? Well, it depends. Am I respecting them as rational agents? I go to the store, I buy something, I give the clerk $5, and they give me the good that I'm purchasing for the $5. We're each valuing the other's rationality. What would it be like not to? Well, suppose I'm being deceived. The clerk says, ah, this is such and such. It's not. It's a trick. Then my rationality is not being respected. Or suppose I pass the clerk a counterfeit bill. I'm not respecting their rationality. What if it turns out one of us is coercing the other, forcing them? I come in and force them to make this trade, when in fact they wouldn't do it. They think this is worth a lot more than $5. Well, then I'm not valuing their own rationality. So in short, 
I can do this, but only if they voluntarily consent to this. There's no coercion. There's no deception. There may be other criteria as well, but surely coercing somebody or deceiving them is a way of violating this sort of respect for them as a rational agent. It's showing disrespect for their rationality. Well, Kant applies his practical test to those test cases that he thought about with respect to the formula of universal law. You shouldn't commit suicide, he says, at least in most situations. There are a few cases where he thinks it's acceptable. But in a lot of cases, he thinks you're using yourself to avoid pain. You're really not valuing your own rationality. You're wiping out, in fact, your future ability to attain what you want. False promising. You're using the person you're making the promise to to gain what you want. You are not respecting their rationality. With respect to your talents, you're using yourself, your own life, for mere enjoyment. You're not giving yourself respect as a moral agent, as a rational agent, because you're not valuing your own rationality adequately. And then charity. Well, you should help other people. Why? If you don't, you're not giving them full respect as rational agents. You are not valuing their ability to attain their ends. Again, it's an imperfect obligation. Doesn't mean you have to value the ends of every single rational being and help them attain it. But it does mean you can't, in general, become selfish and decide that other people's ends, other people's pursuit of their own ends, doesn't make any difference. That's something that applies across the board. And so if you're to respect your own rationality, you have to respect the rationality of others. There are people who really are willing to make exceptions for themselves, or in this case, in terms of the formula of humanity, violate and show disrespect for the rationality of others. This quickly leads Kant to another formulation, the formula of autonomy. He draws a distinction between autonomy and heteronomy. Autonomy is living under the rules you set for yourself. Heteronomy, a matter of living under rules set by others. So heteronomy, you're doing it because somebody else tells you to. Somebody else be requires it. Somebody else says this must be done. You have to. But autonomy, that's a matter of you choosing to live that way. You're still doing it under rules. You're imposing these universal laws for yourself, but you get to be legislator and the person who follows the rules. You're living under rules you set for yourself. He says, this is the ideal of rationality. This is what gives us dignity. We have a kind of dignity that other animals do not because we are autonomous in this sense. We are able to live under rules that we set, not simply that someone else or that nature sets for us. So I am to live as an autonomous being, respecting the autonomy of others, in what in the end Kant calls a kingdom of ends. A kingdom of ends is something that is a systematic union of ends, he says. I am to act as a legislating member of the kingdom of ends. What does that mean? Well, imagine yourself legislating in a kingdom where everybody has this systematic union of ends, all of whom are going to obey these rules. They all participate in making them. They all treat one another with respect as fellow legislators doesn't sound much like most actual legislatures, I'm afraid. But nevertheless, this is an idealized situation. I imagine a scenario where we all are respecting one another as ends, where there is this systematic union. Kant's term for this is the Reichtertzwecke, um, the realm of ends it's sometimes translated. But traditionally, it's known as the kingdom of ends, partly because Kant has in mind as his inspiration here, the kingdom of God. He's thinking of this as being something like the rules that would govern the kingdom of God. Imagine that you are one of the fellow legislators in the kingdom of God, this kingdom where everybody is in effect an angel and everybody is respecting everyone else's uh, autonomy, everyone else's rationality. They're respecting everyone else's moral agent. What rules would you decide to live by? Those are rules you'll set for yourself. You are both legislator and subject to these rules, so you're satisfying the formula of autonomy. You are also treating everyone else with respect, and so you're satisfying the formula of humanity. You are legislating laws for the entire kingdom, so you're respecting the formula of, the universe, uh, of, the, of universal law. So this is why he thinks all of these things are equivalent. We've been led from this idea of universal law through humanity, through autonomy, to the kingdom of ends, 
And then we realize that actually implies all the others. And so what would that be like? Well, it would be like a utopia. And some people worry this is a bit too utopian. So others require, in fact worry that it require, or are delighted that it requires, this systematic union of ends. But I don't think Cod is saying that in this kingdom we would all have the same ends. We would all have exactly the same tastes and preferences and desires and goals and purposes. I think the point is instead there would be a large overlap in our purposes, our ends, because we would all value not just our own ends and our own rationality, but everyone else's ends and everyone else's rationality too. There are some possible objections to these versions of the categorical imperative. One of them is simply that, well, that is utopian. In the kingdom of ends, Kant says, everything has either a price or a dignity. Whatever has a price can be replaced by something else as its equivalent. On the other hand, whatever is above all price and therefore admits no equivalent has a dignity. But that which constitutes the condition under which alone something can be an end in itself doesn't have mere relative worth, that is to say a price, but an intrinsic worth, a dignity. So you and I, as human beings, as rational beings, have dignity. We don't have a price. We aren't things that simply have a relative worth compared to other things. We have a dignity. We deserve respect. And anything that violates our dignity and shows disrespect violates our rights. Well, yes, it may seem utopian to imagine this scenario where nobody's violating anybody else's rights and we all respect the dignity of others. But as I say, I don't think it requires a systematic union in the sense of everybody sharing exactly the same ends and a bunch of robots essentially duplicating one another. I think instead he has in mind here what is true of almost any kind of organization, any family and so on, that even though we may have our own pursuits and our own preferences, we do share certain goals. And among those goals is the welfare of the other people in that group or family or organization. So I think he's saying imagine a situation like that where we're working together to formulate the rules under which we're going to live. That's what we should be doing. And when we do that, we're fulfilling all those versions of the categorical imperative. Well, here is one worry that's a little bit different. Never mistake activity for achievement. And never, well, you might say, substitute intentions for results. Doesn't Kant do that? Doesn't he say, look, as long as I'm doing things for the right reason, I'm doing something morally acceptable? What if I actually respect everyone else but do something really stupid? <laughs> well, I think Kant's answer is true. I mean, it, often it's not enough to just intend to do good. You've got to do the right thing for the right reason, not just do the wrong thing for the reason that would have been right if only it were the right thing. But nevertheless, if you do that, if you make a mistake and do something dumb that actually is harmful, but you were trying to do the right thing, Kant would say, well, you're not making a moral mistake. You're making a different kind of mistake. I don't think you're morally to blame for this in the sense that, you know, you, did, you acted in a way that was inconsistent with morality. You just made a different kind of error. If you ask me for help and then I do something that makes the problem worse, it's, you know, I was trying to help. I was sincerely trying to help. I just screwed it up. Well, in that case, it wasn't a moral failing of mine. It was a different failing. Suppose I was trying to help you fix this toilet and instead I break it completely. Well, that was a plumbing mistake. It wasn't a moral mistake. And so Kant would say, I think, of course, I'm not telling you consequences don't matter in the sense that, hey, just have good intentions. Doesn't matter how you bumble and mess everything up. He's saying, yeah, it matters, but the mistake there wouldn't be a moral mistake. It's a different kind of mistake. What morality requires is having a good will. That's required. But then actually knowing how to fix toilets or how to do a variety of other things that you want to do in the world, well, yeah, you might make mistakes there, but those are different kinds of mistakes. They're not moral errors. There are times when it does seem as if, well, yeah, the thought just doesn't always count. It's not just a question of will, but a question of results. Consequences do matter. And we don't want to do things that are completely ineffectual. After all, we do want to be able to attain our own ends. We don't want to fail at it and just intend to get them, but never get them. 
I think Kant would say that's consistent with my picture of rationality. That's in a way the whole point. I value my own rationality, my ability to attain my ends. So it's not as if just trying to attain them is enough. No, I want to really do it. And that does mean actually choosing the right thing and developing my abilities and capacities and helping others to develop their abilities and capacities, both to help me and also to get what they want. And so this doesn't mean really in the end, oh, all that matters is good intentions, results make no difference. Again, it's a matter of saying, look, I, I do value results. That's what I do as a rational being. I value getting results. And I value my own rationality, my ability to get my results. So I'm certainly not going to say consequences don't matter at all. There is a different kind of failing, though, I think we might worry about more seriously. And it's this. There are two sorts of conceptions you might have about morality. One of them that involves yourself, your own virtue, your own purity of intention. And there is another that thinks of morality as something that's really primarily about how people get along with one another, about groups of people, and what enables them to interact effectively. So on one conception, morality is something that applies to us as individuals, that it certainly has big implications for how we treat other people, but on the other hand, the key to it is something internal. It's really those virtues of thought, feeling, and action within me, as Confucius thought, or my willingness to make an exception for myself or to universalize my maxims or to show respect for others, as in Kant. It's something that really is definable in individual terms. But on another conception, no, morality is a set of rules for how a social group tries to interact effectively in a way that, yes, promotes individual good and respects other people as agents, but on the other hand is really about the good of the group and the ability of people in the group to cooperate, to get along, to effectively combine their efforts to attain good things, not only for each of them, but for the group as a whole. That group-centered conception may or may not be consistent with what Kant is laying out here. So you might say, here are two different ways of thinking about not only ways of thinking about moral theory, but also just ways of thinking about nor moral norms, moral considerations. Some of them do seem to be individualizing. They seem to teach respect, be things that an individual person is supposed to do for other individual people. But others are really about binding groups together, holding them together, things that involve the various interactions of the members of the group that not only benefit them individually, but benefit the group and its larger ability to actually attain its ends. I think Kant comes close to that when he talks about the kingdom of ends, this systematic union of a group of people legislating together. But it's not clear that he succeeds because that really ends up being about respecting the under other individuals and respecting their ability to get what they want. It doesn't really talk about the strength of the group itself and what's good for the group as a whole. So there are conceptions of morality that would say Kant isn't wrong, it's just that we have to add something else. A key element of morality is really about how groups not only respect one another, but actually strengthen the group. And that part might seem to be missing. Where's the teamwork? Where's the group effort? Where's the strengthening the entire group? That doesn't seem really to be, at least in any direct way, present. Maybe indirectly we can explain how Kant can explain the significance of that. Well, I've given you a very quick overview of the structure of Kant's ethical theory. It's something that involves a variety of versions of one fundamental principle, a categorical imperative that basically says you should have a good will. You should respect the rationality of every rational being.